before I say something, I stay up half the night regretting. And I have done that before. Like, oh, Lord, please forgive me. Um, I'm getting text messages this week about if I'm doing the walk. Remember Wednesday, Wednesday night? I guess my walk was pretty popular. <laughs> and I just responded very spiritually. I said, brother, I'm a rotten vessel, but I do my best. And with the help of God's spirit, I, I'm, I'm walking like I ought to be walking. But uh, you've been picking on me about my walk Wednesday night. I don't plan on doing any walks tonight. Actually, what we're going to talk about tonight is not necessarily something that's going to thrill your soul, I'm sure. But if we can get this down, folks, it will change our life forever. Psalm 28, verse number 1. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me, lest if thou be silent to me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds and according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert. Because they regard not the works of the Lord nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I'm helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth, and with my song will I praise him. The Lord is their strength, and he is the saving strength of his anointed. Save thy people, and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also, and lift them up forever. Brother Rob, would you ask the Lord to bless the preaching, please? Amen. Now, I don't know about you, but the most difficult part of all the Christian disciplines, for me personally, the most difficult thing I've ever endeavored to do that I know I'm supposed to do as a born-again Christian is that matter of prayer. I mean, when it comes to reading my Bible, I have good times and bad times, but I seem to be able to, you know, fairly faithfully read my Bible. At least, you know, get my chapter in if I got to, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's acting like, really? You know, reading my Bible, though, most of the time I enjoy my Bible reading. I've come to where I almost can't live without it. I like to read my Bible. And it gets challenging because of my flesh, but it's not the most difficult thing that I do. Attending church faithfully, eh, sometimes you don't feel like it, right? Be honest. Sometimes you're sitting there and you're like, yeah, yeah, I think I could do without getting up and getting ready and rushing off to church on a Wednesday night. I was there this morning. Lord spoke to my heart. I'm feeling good. Super Bowl only comes around, what, one time a year, I think? <laughs> Shows you how into sports I am. But, you know, I mean, this is one time a year. It ain't no big deal. I mean, there are times when church can get a little difficult. But, you know, once you get in the routine of going to church, you know that you're going to walk in there not wanting to be there. And you're going to leave there happy that you came for the most part. Amen. You get to where you just like going to church and you can kind of get that down as a Christian discipline. Uh, how about, you know, uh, giving? You know, after you learn to give a little bit. At first, I imagine it's probably difficult. And when you go through hard times financially and things are a little tight, you know, you kind of, it be kind of hard to write that check when you're pressured a little bit. But, you know, once you learn to give and you see that when I give, God responds and gives back and always meets my needs. And you kind of get that it's more blessed to give than receive thing down a little bit. Giving can become something that we can get used to doing as Christians and do it faithfully, right? Now, I'm not trying to boast about any of these things. I'm not trying to say we got these things down, if you'll notice. These things always are going against your flesh. They're always a challenge, and they're always times where they're difficult and times when they're a blessing, right? How about witnessing? That's a pretty tough one at first. <laughs> and if you get out of the routine at all, it gets tough again. 
And it seems always like that first or, or, or initial reaching into your pocket to get, grab that gospel track can be difficult. But once you got out there and you're, and you're, and you're in the middle of it, it just kind of catches on. You know what I mean? And once you go out and you see somebody saved and, and, you, and, you, and you follow up with them and they come to church and they grow and you disciple them, you build a relationship with them, you see them grow in the Lord, you start to love them a little bit. Man, it can get addictive. You know, you just get to where you're like, man, I need to get out there and start witnessing again. Isn't that true? You fellas have done some street preaching. You know, you, it's hard at first, but once you do it, that's something that you can kind of get in the groove of. You know, you can kind of start missing it a little bit. So that's not the most difficult of the Christian discipline, although all these things can be very difficult. You know what the most difficult one is? Prayer. I find a prayer life, a consistent, steady, and faithful, fervent prayer life to be the most difficult thing for me to learn to do. And if you're honest, you'd say the same thing. I pretty much guarantee you every Christian struggles with that more than anything else if they're honest. Because a praying Christian is a witnessing Christian. Don't say you've got a great prayer life if you're not a witness. A praying Christian is a giving Christian. Don't say you've got a great prayer life if you don't give. A praying Christian's a faithfully attending church Christian. Don't say you got a good prayer life if you don't faithfully attend church. A praying Christian's a Christian who reads his Bible. Don't say you're really communing with God if you're not in the book. How do you even know you're talking to the right God without the book? Praying would be the most difficult of all the Christian disciplines. And yet the most crucial in many ways. Let me say this before we dive into the text. And by the grace of God, I'm going to be brief tonight. So those of you who are sacrificing to be here, when did the game start? 6.30. It hasn't started yet. <laughs> All right, I'll hurry up. Not really. Not really. But honestly, this, this message is pretty concise. Now, before we dive into the text... Let me say this, and this seems like a dramatic statement. Let me say this. I wouldn't bother worshiping or following or serving a God that can't answer prayers. I didn't say I wouldn't worship, follow, or serve a God that won't answer prayers. Because I know that my God doesn't always answer every prayer that I have. If you call no a non-answer, I mean, that's an answer, but if you call it a non-answer, I would not bother worshiping, I would not bother following, I would not bother serving. I'm just too proud to bow down to a God that can't answer my prayers. Amen? If I can take it and destroy it, I'm too proud to bow down to it. Look at the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings and go to chapter number 18, please. 1 Kings chapter 18. <clears throat> Did you guys see that news clip of that preacher that went into his church? I forget what kind of church. It was some kind of a Protestant or maybe even a Catholic offshoot or something. And he went in there and he said, uh, he got up in front of the church and he said, uh, um, you're all good people or something really short. You can look it up. Something real short. Uh, Go in peace, your sins are forgiven, or something like that. And then he ripped off his robe, and underneath it, he had the uniform on of the football team that was playing. He said, I gotta go! And it was like a one minute service. Yeah, the news media went crazy with it. They went crazy with it. It spread all over, man. It was unbelievable. He was some guy out west somewhere. He made a complete mockery of church because of a football game. I guarantee you, that, that boy, I guarantee you, I guarantee he's a false prophet. 1 Kings 18, look at verse number 25. And Elijah said unto the prophets of Baal, Choose you one bullock for yourselves, and dress it first, for ye are many. And call on the name of your gods, but put no fire under. And they took the bullock which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. By the way, morning to noon... They prayed for hours. Just because you pray a long time doesn't mean God's hearing you or you're getting anything done. Oh, Baal, hear us! But there was no voice, nor any that answered. And they leaped upon the altar which was made, and it came to pass at noon that Elijah... Now, here's a man of God. You know, he's smooth, he's slick, 
He's professional. He's loving and kind and gentle before he cuts all their heads off. At noon, that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is talking, or he is pursuing, or he's on a journey, or peradventure he sleepeth and must be awaked. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their manner with knives and lancets, till the blood gushed out upon them. And it came to pass when midday was past, and they prophesied until the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that there was neither voice nor any answer nor any that regarded. Let me tell you something. Why waste your time praying to a God that can't answer your prayers? Why waste your time crying aloud when he doesn't listen? Why waste your time when some hairy man who's a roughneck can make fun of him without getting judged? I wouldn't waste my time praying to a God that can't answer. But notice there is a God that does answer. And Elijah said unto all the people, verse 30, Come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the twelve tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, "Uh, Israel shall, shall be thy name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bullock in pieces and laid him on the wood. And said, fill four barrels with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. Hey, one for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost. Amen. He made sure that all the deck was stacked against God for From a man's point of view. Now watch. The water ran about the altar. And he filled the trench also with water. And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. That Elijah the prophet came near and said. He's not crying aloud. Not some big dramatic show. He said Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and of Israel. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel. And that I am thy servant. And I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God, that thou hast turned their back, their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. (laughs) When God answered, he burned the stones up, folks. Do you know how hot that fire was? When God answered, God answered. That thing was stacked against him. But when God's man obeyed God's word and did it for God's glory, God answered his prayer. Now that's a God worth praying to. And Elijah turned around and took that sword, and you know the rest of the story. I I, I can't help it. Back to Psalms 19, please. 28. (laughs) Psalm 28. I can't help it but to think about that thing with Elijah out there cutting those heads off. You know how long it would take? I mean, if it took 10 seconds per guy, because you've got to move the dead body. Dead bodies are pretty heavy. You've got to clear the stack of heads out as they start building them up, you know, so that they're not falling back over the stump. And you've got to bring the next guy out, and you've got to get them down. And then out of 400, a few of them had to struggle, so there might have been some kind of a fight there. I mean, what, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds per guy? You know how long that man stood there swinging a sword? <laughs> I, you, what, what's your point, preacher? I just think it's cool. <laughs> You ever read your Bible and think about it? He was wore out, man. Hey, that's a God that answers prayers. And that's kind of scary. If God answers prayers like that and has that kind of power to answer prayers, let me ask you a question. Why do you and I quit praying? We ought to learn to be a praying people for three reasons. Let's look at it. Verses 1 through 3. Because God can and will speak to us. He said, unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Now, what's he saying there? He's saying, God, I'm going to call out to you. I'm going to pray to you. I'm going to cry unto you. Why? Why was he saying, Lord, I'm going to cry unto you? Why? What was he looking for? He was looking for God to respond, wasn't he? You realize it's okay when you pray to look for and expect and hope for and long for a response? 
Prayer is intended to be not just you going through a ritual, not just you saying a prayer, not just you trying to alleviate sin, and that's a part of it in confession. You know that as a Christian. But prayer is intended to cause a reaction from the one to whom you're praying. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock, be not silent to me. We need to learn to pray, folks, because we need to hear from him. Lest if thou be silent, To me, I become like them that go down into the pit. Folks, if God doesn't answer me, my life becomes insecure. My life becomes vain. It lacks power. It lacks direction. It lacks some kind of a path and a footing to put my feet on. There's nothing solid underneath me. I learned a long time ago, man, if you're going to get into a fight, you better make sure your feet are grounded. At my age, if I get into a fight with these stupid things on, I will kick them off and go barefooted first. I'm not kidding you. you got to be grounded. And you realize as a Christian, you are in a battle, right? You realize you got an adversary, the devil, right? And your feet need to be grounded. And if you aren't hearing from God and seeing what way he is leading you to go and knowing that that step is the next step that God would have you to take, then you might wind up a mess. You need to hear from God and learn to pray to God because when we pray, God answers. God speaks back. You shouldn't just open your Bible and go through the mundane routine of Bible reading. You ought to open your Bible and say, God Almighty, speak to my heart today. I need to hear from you. This is not just a book. This is not just some good ideas. These are not just some proverbs that if I can figure them out and get the answers from the preacher, then I'll have some head knowledge and maybe make some good decisions and build my best life now. It's a bunch of foolishness, folks, and that ain't Bible preaching. God does not care. He's not interested in you having your best life now. I'm not kidding. That's a bunch of American, that's a bunch of American junk, man. That's a bunch of prosperity gospel foolishness. Your life now just might be rough. But God intends for you and I to live a better life now. Not best, a better life. A life that's given to Jesus Christ. Hey, when you read Hebrews chapter number 11, you see what some of the heroes of the faith went through. Their life was not a bed of roses. It was rough and it was tough. But it got something done for God and it was worth living and it carries on into eternity. I want to make sure that if my going is rough and if my pathway is steep, that it's grounded on the rock, it's stable, it's solid, and I'll make it through the fight. I'm more worried about that than I am taking the easy road. You realize they train a lot of the American military to take the harder path. You take the easy road, you're going to get wiped out. Sometimes the safest path is the hardest path. Well, how do you know for sure you're going the right way? Well, if you listen to Joel Osteen and what is that, Saddleback guy, purpose-driven guy and all the rest of them, Rick Warren and all the rest of them, if you listen to them, you're going to think, man, my life's pretty rough. I must not be right with God. Maybe your life's rough because the devil's trying to give you a hard time because he don't like the way you're going. But if you heard from him and you spoke to him and he spoke to you and you know you're on the right path, you can hang in there and fight through it. You'll be all right. The rougher way may be the safer way. Got to have some solid footing. We got to hear from God. Listen, if I don't hear from God, my end might be just like a lost man. I didn't say I wind up in hell. I didn't say my eternity. I said the end of my life. Look at verse number two. Hear the voice of my supplication when I cry unto thee. When I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked. You see that? Draw me not away with the wicked. And with the workers of iniquity which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Let me tell you something. Your flesh is tempted to get drawn away with the wicked, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You aren't any better than the filthiest pervert you work with. And if you're not careful, your flesh is going to be tempted to be drawn away with them. I know a lot of Christians sit in church and act like they're spiritual when their mind is a cesspool and their life, their hidden secret life is abominable. It's an abomination. They're getting drawn away with the wicked. And a saved man and a saved woman's life can wind up in the end just like the life of a person that didn't even know the Lord. What a waste. 
What a scary and a sad thing that is. I've seen it and you've seen it. Men who once preached the gospel of Jesus Christ and lived a good holy life, winding up just in an absolute mess, winding up running away in shame and in disgrace. I mean, my goodness, man, if I, you had time for me to start telling you some illustrations, you would, your, your head would spin. It would scare you half to death. I'm talking about preachers with two and three and four hundred people in their church. Winding up leaving the church in shame with all kinds of accusations. Some of them unproven, some of them proven, having to tuck their tail and leave the ministry because of the mess they wound up in. Can I tell you something? Jesus Christ, when he prayed the example prayer, the model prayer, he said, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Your prayer life has everything to do with you avoiding the temptation of the wicked. But if you aren't praying that thing, you know, we talk, you know, you pick your best time and all that stuff. I agree. When you're digging down, when you're working, when you're really going to get into the Bible and study and you need your mind to be sharp, sure. But let me tell you something, Christian. You ought to start off every single day with at least a portion of Scripture. If you don't have any time in the morning other than to hit your knees and say, Lord, lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. Fill me with the Holy Spirit of God. I want to get right with you before I even start this day. I need you. Walk with me. Talk with me. Minister to me. Speak to me. Work on me throughout this day. And help me to be faithful at whatever time I normally do my devotions to make sure I get a hold of you during that time. But you ought to start off your day in prayer. Why? Because a Christian can wind up just like a lost man. Save people's life can be ruined. He says, draw me not away with the wicked, with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their heart. That's the world. That's the flesh. That's the devil. You realize how many lost people just love to see you mess up once? They love it. Nothing would thrill them more. How many people know you're a Christian? You know, you got bold one particular Monday because the preaching was, you know, by some chance happened to be fairly good on Sunday. And the Lord spoke to your heart. You go out there ready to win souls because you're all aggressive on Monday. But a couple months passes, you know, and you're not quite as fired up as you used to be. And there you are talking in such a way that just corrects and contradicts and goes against your witness beforehand. And they might act like they're your buddy. But you know what's in their heart? Don't kid me. They'll walk away from you that fast. Oh, not him. He's a good buddy. Yeah, right. And say, did you hear him? Did you hear Reagan? Yeah, Reagan's a Joe Christian, ain't he? <laughs> did you hear what he said? Yeah, he goes to church. He's a religious guy. Mischief's in their heart. Come on, think about it for a minute. How many people have you talked about that you pretended like you liked? How many people have you talked about that you actually love? And you feel ashamed of yourself for talking about somebody that you actually loved. How about somebody who's done good to you? And your return for them is to criticize. Right? So what makes you think a lost world doesn't do the same thing? Christian, you and I need to pray because the lost men, the lost women, they'll glory in our mistakes. They'll glory in our failures. And the devil loved to see us wind up just like them. There's another reason we ought to learn to pray. Because it's God that builds us up. Look at verse 5. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of His hands, He shall destroy them and not build them up. I don't know about you, but I'm at a point in my life right now where I, 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 I joy, I enjoy, I enjoy, I rejoice in building things. <laughs> my father-in-law got me this box of, plastic box of uh, drill bits and, and uh, the screwdriver bits and all that stuff for a cordless drill. I didn't have a cordless drill. He said, you need to get one. I'm like, wow, that's a blessing. Thanks, Dad. But he loves my mother-in-law, so he bought her a cordless drill for her birthday. I mean, for Christmas. So I open up the bits and all the other stuff. He got some other stuff, too. I mean, it was, nice. it was a nice present. I mean, it wasn't cheap or nothing. But I open up all this stuff I can't use. Mom opens up the drill. So Mom goes, hey, you know what? Your birthday's in November. I'm going to give you the drill. Oh, man, thanks, Mom. He'll buy me another one. <laughs> you know something? I got the drill, and I got the drill bits and all that stuff now. You know what? It's kind of cool. 
at my house when something's broke. I just kind of, don't tell my wife I said this because she'll hold me to it. But I just kind of like, I like fixing it up. Kind of, we put in some flower beds last year. I mean, we put in some flower beds, man. I was like, yeah, that's my place. Got to get that driveway fixed. But, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but isn't it something like as you get older, you stop worrying as much about playing and doing stupid stuff and you start enjoying putzing around your yard a little bit? Kind of weird, ain't it? You see those old people outside in their yard all the time and you think they're crazy. I don't know. Just Your priorities just sort of change a little bit, you know? You start wanting to build something. To me, I just like watching my kids get older. I was having just a good afternoon, man. I was having a great afternoon. I'm just, I'm, 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 I weighed my dog. He's weighed 65 pounds. It's not even six months yet. I am happy. I am a happy man. I mean, I'm so spiritual and so deep. <laughs> my daughter's turning 10. The other one's turning 8. They're getting older. I was out in the yard playing with my dog, trying to train my dog this afternoon. And, I, and that you, you, just take, you, just take, you just take pride, I guess, for lack of a better word, and just seeing him, you know, come, you, you throw the volleyball, he runs out there and he gets it through the snow and he runs back to you and then he drops it at your feet and sits and then waits and you pick the ball up and you throw it and you say, go, and, he, and then he goes when he's told and, and just kind of like just training that, just training that dog to be what you want him to be, you know, just, just to interact with you how you want him under control. Just kind of, I don't know, it's a weird thing, just kind of building something, you know. And I keep, instead of thinking of what he is at five months, five and a half months, I'm thinking about what he's going to be like when he's two. And he calms down. You know, and when you knock on my door and he comes through the glass, hey, amen, <laughs> praise the Lord. I, I don't know what it is. Something about building things. Something about training kids and seeing them get a little bit bigger and seeing them start giving back. It's a blessing. There's something about sticking with somebody faithfully up and down times when you slept with one eye open because you didn't want to die. <laughs> Can I get an amen? amen? Thank you. And sticking it out and building something. There's something about that, folks. There's something about, something about starting a church with just nothing but a dream and a prayer, and I would never want to do it again. Amen. My wife and I were talking about that. I said, what do you think? She said, uh-uh. I said, I don't think so either. <laughs> but there's something about just, just starting out and just planting the seeds and doing what's right when you're not sure whether it's going to work out or not, but you know what's right to do and you trust in the Lord and then to see God start to build it. You know why I need to learn to pray? You know who the builder is? You know who the builder is? You know why I destroy everything I get a hold of? I've had multiple watches and I don't know what in the world happens to them, but they wind up crushed. <coughs> I, I get rings, and before long, they're bent so out of shape, I'm trying to shape them with a pen inside, you know, and pliers. I mean, I, I just, just destroy everything. But I know somebody that builds stuff. You know what God builds? He builds a church. In Matthew chapter 18, don't turn there, please, for the sake of time. Jesus Christ said, I'll build my church. We need to learn to pray, folks, because you know what the Lord's doing right now? He's building his church. I, I, I kind of like our 52909 10-mile road. I like pulling in there. I like seeing what God's doing in your life. I like seeing what God's doing in your preacher's life. I like seeing how with time and faithfulness we're growing together. And I can't wait to see what the Lord's going to do in the future because I think he's got a lot more for us. We're getting ready to start a, a blog. I've tried it in the past and it just crashed and burned. <laughs> I mean, it just, it just was bad. You know me in words. You should, you should see me try to write words. It's, it's just a horrible run-on sentences. I mean, just, I mean, it's just horrible. <laughs> it's just a mess. You know what the Lord's done? But Brother Josh has come, come along, and he, you know, a couple times he wrote something, and I've seen what he wrote, and, and then Pastor Chad had him start helping out with the Facebook page, or the, the church Facebook, and, and the Jesus Still Saves thing, and he writes it so succinctly and kneels it right on and puts it together, and the grammar looks great. It's like, I'm not embarrassed of this. It's not like, <laughs> who's this redneck they dropped out of school that loves Jesus, you know? I mean, it looks good. <laughs> not, nothing against rednecks that dropped out of school that love Jesus. Praise God for them. But, you know, I, it, it looks, it, it's, it's well done. We're going to start a blog within the next couple of weeks. 
We post those to Facebook and just different doctrines, just succinct and straight to the point. You can go on there and look and just have different little studies there, just, just some discipleship type of stuff to learn, answers for Jehovah's Witnesses and just different stuff like that, all, all kinds of ideas we're working on. But you know, what I, you know what my point is? My point is I like seeing how I tried that a couple of years ago and it failed. It was a couple of years ago, wasn't it? And it failed miserably. But the Lord just starts, he just starts putting those pieces together when he's ready and how he's ready and just kind of sets a thing up and forms it how he wants it formed and he builds it. You know what we ought to do? We ought to pray. About a jail ministry getting ready to start. I, I'm excited about that. that. That's a stinking neat thing. You know what's really neat about it? I'm, I'm going to be put through as long as the FBI clears me and all that stuff, but that was a joke. <laughs> you guys are like, Yep, we're hoping. Um, <laughs> but you know what's neat about it? It's fully staffed. I'm going to be able to go when I can and when I want to, and I won't have to go every single time. And by the grace of God, we're planning on going two different times a month, and it's going to be fully staffed. Praise the Lord, man. Now, I love that ministry, and I want to be involved in it, but reality is sometimes, you know, just pulled too many different directions, and I need to focus on my discipleships. And spring's coming, man. I got to focus on soul winning. Got to focus on getting my messages ready and my prayer life and all these other things. So this stuff, just the Lord. You know, guys, realize we've had a nursing home ministry for a long time. I, and I praise the Lord. We should be praying for that. And some of you could go help and you know bring people out and just be a blessing, just be a part of that. It's at four o'clock, the the first Sunday of the month. Somebody's out there preaching every month. I haven't been in months. You know what the Lord does? He builds a church. He just puts those pieces in place. We ought to be praying about that. The Lord loves His church. Christ died for His church. And the Lord uses His church. We ought to be praying for it. Look at Psalms 127. Psalm 127. Verse number 1. Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman wake it, but in vain. You know why we ought to pray? Because it's the Lord that builds our home. Did you hear what I said, parents? Married people? It's the Lord that builds our home. Here's a good example. This will help. I hope this will help a little bit. As parents, we want to indoctrinate our kids, right? Right? Yeah, amen. That's my job. You brainwash. Yeah, I am brainwashing them. And I don't let the government do it. They want to brainwash them. My little ones were playing. Uh, the, the two older ones went with my dad for their birthday. He took them to Rainforest Cafe or something like that. And me and Grace were there. The little ones were having cabin fever, so we took them over to McDonald's. And they're playing in McDonald's. And one of my, my five-year-old daughter come running up to my table, which we haven't been there in a couple of years, and we remember why. My five-year-old came running up to the table, and she said, uh, Daddy, there's a boy up there that says he's actually a girl. But I know he's not. That's silly. I said, you go tell him, honey. While you're at it, tell his daddy over there. Let's see if he's man enough to get up. <laughs> I guarantee you he's not if he lets that go. What are you going to do, slap me? <laughs> Anyhow, I'm the one that's supposed to indoctrinate my children, right? You know what the Lord will do? The Lord will work on your kids, parents. Now, I'm not against family devotions. I'm not against that at all. I think it's a great thing. But I've seen parents sit their kids down and do the family devotion thing so religiously and so long that it wears them out. And I think it's great to do family devotions in balance, okay? You ought to do that. If you do family devotions, praise the Lord. That's great. But let me say, that doesn't wrap up your child rearing. That's not teaching them. You know, the Lord will work on them. You'll get them to church in Sunday school, and they'll get in the car after Sunday school, and you're wore out and got a hundred other things on your mind, and they'll say, hey, Daddy, what about? That's my chance. Right? Don't you do that when you're witnessing? Hey, this guy came to me and said he's been having a really bad time and he always went to his parents' church and it was always boring, but he's looking for some truth and he wants to you know, know what the Bible says. Isn't that great? Yeah, did you, yeah, you jumped on that, right? What about the kids? Hey, Daddy, I got a question. The Lord's working. Except the Lord built a house. They labor in vain to build it. 
So when the Lord's working, you know what it's time to do, Mom and Dad? Drop everything and work. Answer that question. When they're singing that song, you get them in the car, and little Ava's just a hysterical man. She makes up words. She knows she does pretty good, actually. But then she makes up words in between when she doesn't get it. You know, the music's playing. And so she'll just, you know, get close to it, and just fill in with gibberish. she got the gift, man. She fills in with gibberish until she gets it again. And, then, and she got done the other day, and she said, well, what about that, Dad? I said, what? She said, I did really good like a big girl. <laughs> like, yeah. Anyhow, but you know what the funny thing is? You'll see the Lord working. He builds the house. Hey, that's, that takes a lot of pressure off parents. <laughs> if you watch the kids and you know each individual kid and you pay attention to that kid and you see God working on them, get with it. You'll see conviction. Oh, that's a good one. I got one particular kid and I won't say who she is, but she's not here tonight. <laughs> she's sick. Well, listen, I got one particular kid. I walk in the room, and I'll know. She'll go. None of the rest of them did that, and then try to get around me and get out the room. And I'll be like, oh, 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 hold the phone. What you doing? You say, what was that? That's her little conscience. That's the Lord working. Don't let it go. Work with him. He'll build them. Ain't that a blessing? You know, parents, we ought to be praying we ought to be looking for discernment from God to build our home. You're in a wicked world, friend. You, you, you people in your 60s, 50s and 60s, 20 years ago, would you have ever guessed? Would you have ever guessed that we're seeing what we're seeing today? Would you have ever guessed that the government would tell you you have to buy health care if you don't have it? Not in a million years. I mean, looking at this stuff, like I mentioned earlier about the kids and what they're trying to brainwash them with in schools, would you have ever guessed that stuff would happen? And you weren't in necessarily, you know, they weren't walking on water back then either. That was the 70s, right, when you were in high school? 70s? 60s? Whew. Way back when. 70s, 60s? Okay. <laughs> 71. All right. Would you have ever guessed that they'd be teaching the stuff they're teaching now? Persecuting kids for bringing a Bible in? How about the rest of us? When our little ones are our age and our grandchildren are the ones that are in there. And we're the laziest generation in prayer that's probably ever been. We've got every distraction on the planet. You know, video games, Nintendos, iPhones, Facebooks, you know, ma you know, mail on your phone. I mean, you can't escape now. Most people probably get out of bed, their feet hit the floor, and that's what they're doing. Let's be honest. What we should be doing is spend a little time with God. We're so distracted. And while we're distracted with our pleasures and with our little just innocent distractions, the devil's wreaking havoc in the home. And he's weakening the church. And you know what else he's doing? He's destroying the Christian. Look at Jude chapter number 20. We'll be right back here to Psalm in a minute. Jude chapter 20. Chapter 20, Jude, verse 20. You know what I meant. <clears throat> but ye, beloved, building up your pastor, and not laughing, I mean building up yourselves on your most holy faith, look at it, praying in the Holy Ghost. You know what the Holy Ghost will do, Christian? He'll build you up. And I'm not talking about the Joel Osteen way. And I'm not talking about the Christian psychologist way or the worldly psychologist way. I'm talking the Holy Ghost will build you up in your faith. When everybody else is always trying to kick you down, kick you down, kick you down, and let me say this, too much fundamental preaching beat people down so much for so long and put the spiritual performance level so high that it wasn't attainable that people have become discouraged to the point of quitting. <clears throat> the Holy Ghost wants to build you up you don't have to set the world on fire get up tomorrow morning and pray Amen. well I'm not be quiet pray I'm just not very spiritual just shut up and pray Amen. well I'm not the Lord's favorite just shut up and pray <clears throat> some of my kids communicate better than others really 
Ava doesn't stop communicating. My word, man, she's got her daddy's problems. I mean, it's like unbelievable. When I'm going, shut up, kid, my word, give me a break, that's bad. Some are better communicators than others, but do you think that I don't want to hear from the ones who don't communicate as well as the others? Of course I want it. Actually, sometimes I want to hear from them more. Stop a minute, sit down and talk to me. What's going on? No, seriously, what's going on? Nothing, no, not nothing, what's going on? Talk to me. Folks, you know what we need to do? We need to just talk to our Father. We have all kinds of excuses. Look at the last reason, back in Psalm 28, please. <clears throat> Psalm chapter 28. The last reason we ought to learn to pray. Verse 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I'm helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth and with my song will I praise him. The Lord is their strength. He is the saving strength of his anointed. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. You know why we need to learn to pray, folks? Because reaching out to God and crying out to God actually gives you the strength to make it. He said, the Lord is my strength in verse number 7 and my shield. In 1 Kings chapter 9 and verse number 7, you don't, don't turn there for the sake of time, but you find Elijah right after he conquered all those prophets of Baal. He just accomplished an unbelievably amazing thing, hadn't he? A great victory. You find him over there in chapter number 19, depressed, discouraged, and quitting on God. And the Lord showed up to him, and the Lord gave him something to eat, and he said, because the journey is too great for thee. Now here's the point that I'm getting at. Let me tell you something. The Christian life is too much for you. It's just too much. The ministry, <laughs> it's just too much. And I got it great. I'm spoiled. I'm spoiled, and, I, and I'm happy. I'm, I'm not saying I'm not happy. I'm a happy man. I, I'm too happy. Sometimes I get annoying. Amen? But listen, the pressure of it is real. The pressure of the Christian life is real. Against the world, against your flesh, against the devil, and then we get the weather. And I'm telling you, folks, this time of year, listen, this time of year, it gets rough on everybody. This is the worst time of year, ain't it? You're kept indoors. You're not getting that sunshine. Vitamin D levels are a lot lower in your body. You're cold, you're cramped up. It just, after a while, you know, you start getting cabin fever and it messes with your head. You start getting discouraged and the pressure builds up too much. And you go to the Lord in prayer and He's your strength. I get up off my knees sometimes so much stronger than I went down. Why? Because the Lord gives me strength for my journey. Remember what He said to Moses? As thy days, so shall thy strength be. One of the greatest lessons, I mean, you've heard me say it before from this pulpit, that I'm a worry wart, right? You've heard me say that. Man, I'm, I, I'm real bad about worrying. I'm real bad about worrying. You know, one of the greatest things the Lord's ever done to help me with that? Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. <laughs> yeah, I got a bill due tomorrow and I got no money. I guess I'll worry about it tomorrow. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, the doctor thinks he might have found something, so we're going to find out next week. So next week, I'll worry about it. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Why borrow from tomorrow's evil today? Amen. But you know how you can do that? The only way you can keep your mind in that position? Getting on your knees and praying. And the Lord shows up. Verse 8 says he's the saving strength of his anointed. He's the saving strength. He shows up and he pulls you out of that mess. But if you're not praying, he ain't answering. He ain't pulling you out. We struggle through this life. We struggle through our temptations. We fail. We quit. But we never spend the time to get on our face and pray. He helps you withstand attacks. He says in verse 7, he's my shield. What do you need a shield for if nothing's being launched at you? Your prayer life. 
Verse number 9, your prayer life brings the blessing of God. Save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Feed them also and lift them up forever. He's asking God to come in there and save his people and feed them and bless them. Can I tell you something? God answers prayers. The God of the Bible, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he answers prayers. And let me tell you something. John tells us, the book of John tells us, to ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. You know why Christians are miserable? Because they ain't praying. You walk in all grouchy and all glum and all bummed out, you ain't had a very good prayer life this week, I guarantee you. I guarantee you. Be honest. Except for tragedies, and that's a, there's, a, there's an allowance for that. But Christians that just under normal circumstances having a rough week, walk in all bummed out and glum and down, beat down all the time, you know what the problem is? They're not praying. He saves them. He blesses them. He lifts them up. He gives them strength. He protects them. I've had answers to prayers in a physical way. In a physical, realistic way. When I start praying, God, I'll make me a soul winner. He sends me people to witness to. And I've had financial needs, and I've prayed in, I literally, and I'm not, a, you've already heard me cracking on the prosperity gospel, and if you want, if you, if you doubt me at all, come back Sunday morning. I, I'm against that stuff, but I've prayed in literally thousands of dollars. Thousands of dollars. I prayed it in. We had a real bad offering last week, about 50% of budget. And we have about $1,000, close to a $1,000 plow bill so far. And I'm like, good night, Lord. <laughs> so I was praying for 3000 for the general fund this morning. We had 2914 and we haven't counted tonight's offering. Amen. Amen. Hey, ain't that neat? That was this week. I, was pray- I wanted 3000 I-, I told the guys, I want- I'm- we have to pray for $3,000 this week, right? 2914 and some change this morning. And 880-something, I think, came in for the Hoffmans. Whew. Exceedingly, abundantly above all that you can ask or think. God answers prayers, folks. I'm not trying to tell you, you know, go pray for money. I'm just trying to say if your heart's right with God and if you're praying according to God's will and you're in the book and you're doing right and you're seeking God's face, he'll take care of all that stuff and he's able to answer financially. Thank God for that. He promised to provide all of our needs, according all our need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He promised. Ain't that a blessing? Let me ask you a question. Why don't we pray more? It's not rocket science. It doesn't really take you studying and trying to read old English words. It doesn't embarrass you publicly like witnessing. It's not as difficult as being a Christian husband. Why don't we do it? Be honest. You you know you don't pray like you should. I think maybe our adversary wants to keep us off our knees. I think maybe he's afraid of what God might get done if we start. Bow your heads with me if you would please for a word of prayer. I'm going to open up the invitation. I think it would be a great time to start. And let's ask God to help us to become a praying people like we ought. Father, bless us now. Speak to our hearts. Teach us to pray.